the favorites here or the scary things um from a Buick 8 is a very interesting choice to me of all the Stephen King imagine if this is five stars like this one I think I'm just wondering like what the point is of reading this all I have to say is f this book like literally what the f this isn't horror so now I think it's time to build my own list of the scariest books that I've ever read Hello friends, it's Kayla. Welcome back to my channel. This week I'm so excited to embark on some horror reading. So Goodreads last year put out this article of the top horror authors of the year recommending their favorite scary books, their top recommendations for things that they find frightening. Some of my favorite horror authors ended up in that article, so I thought what we would do today while I've explored booktubers who have similar tastes to me, why not take a look at authors who have similar tastes to me and find my like reading twin. <laughs> so let's just go through the article and see what's here. First up we've got Sarah Gately. I didn't like Just Like Home but I've loved things from this author before. However when we look at their recommendations I have given three stars to a couple things that they absolutely love and When No One Is Watching was a five for me. So the one I have left is number one fan but based on the other ratings and things we don't have that much in common so we're gonna skip by that to Gabino Iglesias. Top reads from him include The Hunger and A Head Full of Ghosts, which again, three star reads for me. I haven't yet read his book, The Devil Takes You Home, um, but Tinfoil Butterfly was a five star to me. So again, I could read Last Days, but our taste isn't perfectly aligning yet. Um, as we continue, there's Stephen Graham Jones. Don't Fear the Reaper was a four star for me. My Heart is a Chainsaw was a five star for me. Every Stephen Graham Jones is a four or five. So when we look at his top ones, Come Closer by Sarah Graham was also a five star. Uh, the loop was a two. So there's two things in here, The Girl Next Door and Exquisite Corpse, that sound appealing to me, not just because of this, but also because they're some of the top horror recommendations that I see around the internet, um, just of like gruesome, disgusting, horrific, scary books. Then we've got Alma Katsu, who I have given, like we just saw, The Hunger, three stars, but I really like her short stories. Um, and in her favorites include The Paul Bearers Club, which is one of my all-time favorite, not really a horror, horror books. And the fact that that is on her list, um, and we've got Gabino Iglesias, who we just saw, and I feel like reading from him would be cool. And then The Grip of It is on here by Jack Gems, who I have had this book like recommended and disrecommended to me so many times over the years that I am intrigued. Next up, we've got T. Kingfisher. What Moves the Dead was one of my literally dead book club picks for the year. I gave it four stars or a little bit under. I've loved things from T. Kingfisher, felt okay about most things. Um, and the favorites here or the scary things, um, from a Buick 8 is a very interesting choice to me of all the Stephen King. Uh, I do kind of want to read The Fisherman, but because I didn't like Annihilation or The Stephen King, we can skip past this. Which brings us to Alexis Henderson, again, one of my favorite fantasy horror authors. House of Hunger and The Year of the Witching were five stars for me. And of her top ones, The Hacienda and Tender is the Flesh and Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke, all of these were a high four or five for me. And then we have a DNF. And... I can't remember how far I got into The Return by Rachel Harrison, why I DNF'd. So I'm not gonna lie, I though have read two more books from her and given her two and three stars. I'm intrigued and I wanna see if Alexis Henderson and I are that perfect match because right now we are. Then we've got Paul Tremblay, again, The Paul Bears Club, an absolute favorite of mine. And also on his list is Come Closer, which I loved. Uh, and on his list is Stephen Graham Jones, one of the ones that I really need to read, the ones that got away. And Our Share of Night by Mariana Enrique, which is very intriguing to me. Because he wrote one of my favorite books of last year, I feel like I should include him. And then we have Isabel Cañas, the author of The Hacienda. And this is interestingly all short story collections. And because I really didn't like other terrors, though there is one here on my TBR, I think we can skip past this. And last on the list is Ainsley Hogarth, author of Mother Thing, which is not interesting to me. But one of her recommended books is The Good House by Tana Reeve Do, which was a high four for me. So again, the grip of it being on this one, I feel like I could be reading it for multiple authors at the same time. I took a trip to my local library. They had so many things that I wanted to read. So here's the TBR for the week. The only one I don't have is the Stephen Graham Jones, which I believe Maybe I'm mixing up with another one, but it was like exclusively an audiobook or it's just hard to find. The grip of it, I believe, is about some type of ancient evil. Exquisite Corpse by Poppy Z. Bright is about serial killers. The Girl Next Door is also blurred by Stephen King. This is based on a true story and I think it's real 
life murder, kidnapping, torture. Then we've got The Return, which I think is creature horror, but I don't really remember. It's about a bunch of friends in a motel. The Devil Takes You Home sounds like it's about the devil. And Our Share of Night, this big, long, recently translated book by Megan McDowell is it's it's about like a road trip and a cult which you might not associate with my favorite things however i've had people tell me that i will like this there's a secret society that commits unspeakable acts in search of eternal life that sounds interesting so i'll check in with you when i pick something up and let you know what i think of each one and if i finish them all and who my author reading twin taste twin is by the end now you might look at that list of 36 we just went through and think those aren't really scary and that's fine because horror is subjective. Since the article was about what these authors find scary it's great that there's a little insight into just that. Alma Katsu highlighted the best horror novels to her are personal. They strike at a terror we hold or perhaps have hidden close to our hearts. The best horror hits us where we live. And then for Ainsley Hogarth, she said she's sucked in by detail. Not the quantity of detail, but the quality. That's what pulls her into a horror book. She's terrified of what evil lurks there once you describe the setting really well. So while I don't look at these personally and think they're the scariest books that I've read, I'm I mean, this one more than this one for sure. Since I enjoyed both, I think what it highlights is what this will have in common with it. So I'm not going into this expecting to be the scariest thing I've ever read, but what's scary to these authors, which if not scary for me, is at least enjoyable. So I think this should be a win. We're starting with the grip of it. So this is the one I definitely knew the least about going into it. Uh, I wasn't expecting a haunted house story, but it seems like a haunted house story, or it could be haunted people. I'm not really sure yet. The writing is very strange. Um, I didn't think that I picked a haunted house book because I wanted to make sure my official haunted house book of the month was my literally dead book club pick for March, The Spite House, which I'm still so excited to get into. Um, I am relaunching merch. I might as well do it right alongside this video because I want everyone to be able to get the white one for the spring season because I'm gonna try tie-dyeing it. And I think that'd be really fun if we all tie-dyed our own white t-shirts. But anyway, we've got this couple, Julie and James, and it's that classic setup of people moving away from everything that they know and having a fresh start. So the house that they bought is a little bit odd. I think it has House of Leaves vibes for sure or Inspiration which is one of my favorite books because there are parts of the house that are unexplainable like there seems to be gaps between certain places and they're like oh that's just like a closet that's just in between rooms like let's not look into it and then when they do look into it like there's one point where she gets trapped in like a secret room in the house. However I want to preface if you haven't picked this up and you think it sounds intriguing it doesn't feel like uh it doesn't feel scary there was one scene so far i'm 100 pages in that gave me a little bit of chills which doesn't happen very often but basically this house is just confusing in nature and it makes the people in it confused so like you'll be talking to someone and then you'll hear their voice behind you stuff like that but the way that it's written makes it feel not scary because it doesn't feel like you're in the scenes it feels like you're reflecting on them. They're constantly talking about the way that they just felt or something they just experienced rather than being in the middle of it and worrying for them. Since I don't read a lot of synopsis, I still haven't read further on so I don't know if this gives away like what's to come. They are looking into like the history of the town. People are talking about the house as if they shouldn't be there, but things are getting even weirder. Like suddenly you're in the house but then you're somewhere else. So it's like, are they losing their minds? Are they losing time? Or is there something in the house? I can't wait to find out. I'm so hooked. What? The Beatles. They call me Cuba Beat. Okay, I see a Cuban beef. Chick chicka boom, chick chicka boom, chick chicka boom. It is so late. <laughs> I finished the grip of it. I really enjoyed the grip of it. I'm gonna give it like a four or a 4.5. I feel like I would put it in the category of a house at the bottom of a lake, the cabin at the end of the world, maybe even we spread and 
fever dream. I don't know where it is, but all for different reasons. Like these aren't super similar, but there is this kind of like ambiguous nature to them. Uh, some are like cosmic horror and they're equally as much about the relationship as the spooky thing that's going on. And there's also a sense of unsatisfaction that you get from these that I love. Like it's not about blood and guts and killing. It's just this general vagueness of these people, their relationship falling apart, their mental health crumbling, um, them struggling with work and friendships, all because there is this sense of haunting. There's just this general sense of dread and I understand why this has a pretty low Goodreads rating is because the ending doesn't really give you everything you're probably looking for. But I enjoyed the writing of this. I enjoyed the narrative voice a lot. I think it was just a really interesting time and I'm so glad that I enjoyed it. As usual, lowly rated horror that doesn't really feel like horror is my favorite type of horror. So now we have two authors that I have more things in common with and it only feels right to continue with all Makatsu and just confirm it all with The Devil Book. I'm now 100 pages into The Devil Takes You Home by Gab Bino Iglesias. My house was very quiet and peaceful and studious today and I didn't want to disrupt that by updating you at all. So now I'm uh, a third to a half of the way in. I didn't actually realize this was under 300 pages until just now. So Rob is studying for his gas ticket. Liam was studying for refereeing for the next age range up. So now he's refing full ice. Um, so he was doing a lot of studying today. And then he's currently now out of the house and doing said refing. And I'm finally home by myself. So I thought I would check in with you. Um, I don't really have any feelings about it so far. So we're following this guy who he's kind of lost everything, feels like he doesn't have a lot to live for. It's reminding me of Razorblade Tears right now, which is more of a thriller, um, just with a man who loses his child and then is on like this violent mission. It's kind of like, this one's revenge. This one is just like bad men. He might as well kill them and take on these jobs because he's also living in poverty now. His wife has left him. And what I'm liking is discussing like the impact of poverty. Um, Cause I know a lot of people say like, you know, money doesn't buy you happiness, but if you are literally spending every day just worried about your own survival, if the difference between not having money and money means you have just like a shelter over your head and food to eat and you don't have to just think about basic survival every day like once you hit that sure maybe more money doesn't guarantee happiness but the willingness to do anything and kind of give up any real morality to survive is a very real situation that you can end up in so he's taking this job that has to do with drugs and killing people and the little bit of horror that's been introduced has to do with him Growing up having kind of premonitions, he has like waking dreams and he feels like he's getting signs for different things. Um, and he's pretty angry with that ability because no one told him, like nothing ever gave him a hint that his child, he would lose his child, his child would get sick. And so now he's kind of on a self-sabotage mission. So there's talk of grief, which is something I always appreciate in books, but it is pretty high violence, similar to Razor Blade Tears and why I didn't love that storyline. So I'm definitely ready for it to get more horror. I don't have any feelings yet about the plot or the writing. It's just all kind of okay and we'll see where it goes. The only thing that I noted um, was where we get the title from. Like I love in movies or shows or books when you finally understand what the title means and they literally say the title in the book. So he goes, you know, because sometimes God is your co-pilot, but it's the devil who takes you home. And I thought maybe that was a bigger quote that was well known, but it seems to be just from this book. Maybe, I don't know. I'll try to remember to check in with you at like two thirds of the way in. Yeah, so unfortunately I just don't, I didn't feel like I needed to update you until I was done with it. Um, it's pretty much the same tone throughout the entire thing. And if it was any longer, I would have DNF'd it. It's just not my type of horror and that's fine. Very action packed, fast paced. Um, I feel like it's kind of uh, Breaking Bad, 
I was gonna say Ocean's Eleven. I've never seen either of those things, but I just feel like getting this group of people together and kind of investigating and making this plan and also like drugs and the setting and the killing, I don't think it did anything wrong. I'm gonna give it like a, like a 2.75. It was also definitely unfair of me to say it didn't feel horror yet because the horror is the reality. Like we're talking about the death of a child. We're talking about racism in here. We're talking about like horrific events that are happening in reality. Um, but seeing as there was a little supernatural element, I just meant like it wasn't enough of the horror supernatural. It was more horror reality. I was waiting for this to pick up more and I remained waiting for this to pick up more. I liked a lot of what this book had to say regarding like always feeling like you have to fight and how we're born screaming and how throughout our entire life we're just fighting, especially when it comes to certain groups um, and discrimination and things that people are encountering in here. And I also liked what it had to say by the end about like not taking for granted what you have and appreciating things because, you know, your, things can just get ripped away from you so easily. Nothing objectively wrong with this, just not my taste to get to those messages, you know? Um, if I were to rank this as far as the way that I do the Goodreads horror stuff at the end of every year. When it comes to the type of horror that it was, I would probably give it a two as far as the weirdness goes. If we're comparing to the grip of it, I would give that one, oh, I was gonna say a four, but that feels a little high. For the scares, it's like a zero. Scares for the reader, I don't think are really here, but the unsettling rating is a three. Uh, they're really, like there's a lot of violence, but it doesn't feel particularly unsettling except for two or three specific scenes um, regarding children that are very uncomfortable. And then intrigue, I don't know, I think I would have to give it like a, a two. This is definitely pretty forgettable. Like all the people we meet along the way, everyone they're working to fight against, he is encountering people who are working with him, but once he realizes what they're actually doing, um, he's surprised, caught off guard, um, by how horrific like everybody involved is the bad guys and the good guys like it's all kind of twisted I do think this is interesting that it was a recommendation from Alma Katsu who also had the grip of it because I would consider that just a different vibe altogether even though they do similarly have like couples at the heart and they feel rooted in reality for a lot of it, dealing with real life circumstances, which is what she highlighted being a fear. So I get it, though now I have had a big win and a loss from her. So that's interesting. We'll have to see what happens next. Today I'm reading The Return by Rachel Harrison. I'm about to make myself a yogurt bowl and let's see what Alexis Henderson had to say about her fear. To me, a book that is truly frightening is one that evokes the senses and explores the complexity of fear. If a book can make me feel not just afraid, but disgusted, dread-filled, shocked, psychologically, or even existentially disturbed, that makes it all the more frightening. That's a book that will get under my skin and haunt me for long after I've finished reading. I would say Tender as the Flesh and Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke really fit into that as far as actual books that made me uncomfortable. Um, and The Hacienda is one that has definitely lingered with me. I have really strong memories of that book. Not even the plot, but just how I felt reading it. So I'm so excited to give this another go. If this was any other author, I probably wouldn't have picked up something again that I had DNF'd. But I think maybe there was just something that I'm missing about it. And the cool part is I went and checked to see if the audiobook was available anywhere. And I found it on Libro FM because I already downloaded it. It's actually one of the first books that I bought on Libro FM or use my credit for. If you don't know what that is, it's like a really great alternative to Audible because it also connects you with indie bookstores. So you can link it and financially support your indie bookstore even though you're using um, an audiobook service. I'll put my link down below. It gets you a free audiobook and me a free audiobook if you sign up with my link. But so what's cool about it is I went in and it told me that I had gotten 10% into the audiobook before I stopped reading. And I think it's just that I wasn't super intrigued immediately. And then it didn't end up being like, in the awards. So I had no reason to prioritize it over the other 15 books that I was reading that month. Rachel Harrison writes kind of 
cozy horror. It's always lighter. It's kind of small town. It's got a limited cast and cackle and such sharp teeth weren't my favorite, but I'm excited because I just reread the first 10% and I think it's fine. We have this one main character, Elise. I wanted to make sure I got her name right because there's four girls in here. We have Elise and her two friends, Molly and May. And then we have Julie and Julie went missing. And at the 10% mark, they just found her. So she has no memory of where she's been the last two years and Elise, has always predicted that she would come back, that she was just looking for attention or something, which is like questionable to think about your friend. So the relationships right from the beginning feel a little bit questionable. Who knows how good of friends they are, if they're toxic. But now it seems like they're gonna go on a trip together, all of them. And I am excited because I haven't been spoiled or anything. Like, I don't know what type of horror this even is. Here's my yogurt bowl, because I know you're interested. Strawberries, cherries, cashews, banana, frozen i just put a bunch of frozen fruit into yogurt and then it almost feels like frozen yogurt without the yogurt actually being frozen because i don't like frozen yogurt what am i talking about i have no clue where this is about to go but i'm liking it at this point so that's great i'm so annoyed i said the word audible when i you were there just a second ago and now i have just gotten an audible ad on three different social media platforms. Went to Instagram, got an ad. Went to YouTube, got an ad. Went to TikTok, got an ad. I have been working so hard to not get book-related content everywhere where I don't want it to be. And now my phone has been listening to me. I haven't seen an ad for that company in months. Crazy news. This is going so well. I'm halfway through. There is no plot. Like this truly is about nothing. Um, there's just like a group of friends and they're staying together and their friend was missing and now she's back. She has no memory, like I said. And that's like all it is. They're just constantly concerned about what happened to her, wondering what happened to her, where she's been and she doesn't know. And she's acting strange. It's reminding me of the Paul Bearers Club. As far as it feels like it has an implication that there's vampires, but in this one, it's like the main character of the story is convinced his friend's a vampire, but it's not a vampire story. And in this one, I think the book's trying to convince us that she's a vampire, but I don't think it's a vampire story. Julie's just behaving in a way that makes it seem like that's what's going on. Uh, this group of friends, I just love their dynamic. I love how we get to hear about how they're dressed, how all of their rooms at the hotel are designed. And it's really just a friendship story, which is what's giving the cozy horror vibes. And I just went to check the Goodreads because I wanted to see the average rating and I mistakenly saw one of my friend's reviews and they just said, I hated the plot twist or whatever. And now I'm sitting here like, what's the plot twist? There's gonna be a plot twist? Like, I need to know. I don't want to get too excited, but like, imagine if this is five stars, like this one. as I thought it would be. My friends, I'm so conflicted. I'm so annoyed. Like I'm actually genuinely annoyed with this author because I don't know what is going on, but I feel like she just does not have the right publishing or the right editor or something because she's doing interesting things and all of her books have the same message. So I feel like there's such a clear intent but she also just wastes so much time. And like, I was waiting for an ending. Like it's not one of those books that leaves you not knowing things and there's this ambiguous nature that's fun. It just kind of leaves you with this super drawn out ending. Like that was 50 pages of, like when the horror really did come in was, that and I thought they're for sure it's it's leading to something like we're gonna find something out there's gonna be a twist there was no twist there was an explanation to the horror and I'm just wondering if maybe some people like I've never seen this marketed as a thriller or mystery but maybe it was somewhere and so when it turned into horror that's what people considered like a twist but it is a supernatural horror and it it felt like it was that from the 
very beginning. But I'm conflicted because I was having a good time. Like, I like this kind of a story. This is just a lot of dialogue between a lot of women and it's exploring this friendship, but it's also like comforting, even though it is horrific. Like, there are truly gruesome, gory scenes. Um, it reminds me of the feeling and plot-ish of Jennifer's body, that it is horror, but at the same time, it's like a comfort watch. Like it has fun energy, even though it's horror, but it was just too long. If it's not gonna do anything at the end, if it's not gonna give me something at the end, like what was I waiting for? I just don't think she knows how to end a book. Like, I don't know if she realizes that she is building to a twist that never comes. And I feel that way about all of her books. There needed to be like a hundred less pages or it was gonna end with something surprising. All of the shit talking I'm doing right now, I'm gonna give this, it's either a four or just under a four, which feels so weird because I really was let down by the end, but I at least was having a good time throughout it, which I can't say for all of her stories. So I thought today we'd get into Paul Tremblay's picks so I could have a physical book and an audiobook going. The Stephen Graham Jones that I was thinking of is the babysitter one that's an audiobook. Uh, the ones that got away is just really expensive for some reason, but the audiobook was at my library, so I grabbed that. And then I'm gonna read Our Share of Night physically later today. I'm about to head out and I think the audiobook will be good. I can check in with you throughout the day each time I listen to a story. What Paul Tremblay said is the big pyrotechnic, loud, scare set pieces generally are enjoyable, exciting, in a fun house way, but the moments that burrow down deep inside me are the quieter, uncanny, unexpected glimpses into the inexplicable, the unnameable things. To paraphrase Mariana Enrique, they can only be explained or communicated in the language of horror. So Come Closer being on his favorites totally aligns with that because it's a more personal, um, slow haunting or possession story. And then if we look at what Isabel Kanya said, because uh, The Ones That Got Away is a short story collection, seeing as all of her recommendations were short stories, she said, short form horror is especially good at this, an, an oozing dread. Uh, they place voice and atmosphere front and center, setting the mood and weaving suspense in ways that can scare me easily. I am about to head out to the bookstore, so if that short story collection is there. I might consider picking it up. The first story from the collection was something about a rabbit, something, something and a rabbit, like a man, a boy and a rabbit, kind of survival, living in the forest and eating rabbits, but also like, I don't know, being unsure if anything was real. It was weird. Naturally, it's a horror story and it's from Stephen Graham Jones. So weirdness checks out, but I don't think it really had a, a big impact. So I'm gonna give it a three. I stopped at Value Village with no luck, which was a little sad, but I've now gotten three more stories into the short story collection. Uh, one of them was called, I jotted them down, Till Morning Comes. I gave it three stars. There was this like vague uneasiness throughout it. There was a family and somebody missing within the family and then like maybe a bad person in the family. Definitely a sense of dread, but was just okay. And then Sons of Billy Clay was like a traditional Stephen Graham Jones mix of like humans and animals and like how there's consciousness um, shared. And I gave it one of three as well. And then So Perfect, I gave a four. Set in Danvers, which is my favorite setting, a bunch of teenage girls. There was Bugs and like eating disorders and self-image and friendship and bullying. And I thought it was a, an interesting, unique kind of take. And now I'm halfway through one called Lone Gan's Luck. And it's about this man who's coming to town with all of these like potions, kind of medicine remedies for people in town and they don't trust him. So naturally I ended up in the horror section. I didn't find that short story collection. They didn't have it in stock, but I did grab this short story collection by Eric LaRocca. It's called The Trees Grew Because I Bled There and it's blurbed by Mariana Enrique, who I'm about to go inside and read her book. And then I got two things from the mystery section. Then I decided to go to Michael's and get some tie dye so I could just do it in this video and test to see if the Literally Dead Book Club shirts at their current state can handle tie dye because like the best thing to take tie dye is 100% cotton. So I grabbed 100% cotton cheap shirt from there that I can do a comparison for. And I don't know if Bonfire has 100% cotton, but I'll look into that if necessary. I really want a lime green Literally Dead Book Club shirt and I'm willing to sacrifice mine to test 
if it works. The Stephen Graham Jones story that I was reading, I ended up giving a three. It was just okay. And then after that came one called Monsters that I'm giving a five. Uh, it was about a couple people and a summer and a vacation town and a dog. And then after that was Wolf Island, which I'm giving like a two just for my own personal taste. It was about like wolves and dolphins. Very strange. And that's where I'm at, 40% in and switching over to my physical read. Sick. That worked really well. Oh my god! I'm obsessed. Like, this could truly not have turned out any better. Like, this was exactly what I was envisioning. I'm so stoked. The shirt took to the color perfectly. This is the other one. The color, it looks a little bit different because I used, okay, I used two bottles of this one. And in the second bottle of the green, I put literally just a sprinkle of the blue because I wanted it a slightly different green. So I had two tones of green, but not like really obviously two tones of green. And this one, I just used a green bottle. But as far as like the color penetrating it, it worked, it worked perfectly fine. I did it dry. I already washed this once and dried it. So do that if you're trying to prep it and you wanna do it the exact same way that I did. Um, and then I did it dry. I used two whole bottles, but my shirt is like a 2X. So I needed more bottles for more fabric. It looked fully saturated. And then I wrapped it in saran wrap for six hours. And then I rinsed it out with water. And then I put it on like a really big load with tons of water in the washing machine and just like a teaspoon of laundry detergent. And it turned out so well. I was worried I wouldn't be able to do the crumple style. So that's why I did the spiral on the other one in case I screwed this one up and had to buy myself another one. I just feel like this is so fun and it matches the April pick which I wasn't even planning. Like I really just am in love with neon lime green lately. Rob said it reminded him of Goosebumps. Speaking of neon green, actually no, this is um, neon yellow, but I used to have nails that looked exactly like this and they were such a vibe. So last night I got to part three, which is only 150 pages in, but it felt like I read a lot. <laughs> I felt like I was reading for a long time. Um, so the first part is pretty much the entire 150 pages, but there is a part two that's very short that gives you insight into another character. And then I think in part three, we're jumping forward in time because basically we're following this father and his son. And right now I would say number one genre is fantasy, but obviously I'm only 150 pages in. So it's just setting up this like society and all of the magical medium like rules and stuff. This man has lost his wife and he can communicate with the dead and maybe his son can too, but he doesn't want this like magical order that he's a part of to know that because there's all of these weird things about death and like taking over other people's bodies and other people will want to go in his son's body or force him to go in his son's body. And the thing about his wife being dead is he's waiting for her to show up because he can see dead people, but she hasn't. So he's questioning, I guess, like where her spirit really is. And at the beginning of the book, we're just seeing the son starting to get powers and this order um, wanting to take advantage of that. So, but he wants to like protect his son. So he's putting him kind of in, I don't know what I would call it, witness protection. Like he just has a security team following him around at all times. That's what the beginning of part three sounded like it was doing. The first part just set up the whole system and these like demons and conjuring and sharing consciousness. Um, and he, the man has been like preparing for death for a long time, everyone around him. There was a lot of like sexual exploits and him just engaging with various people. Um, and he's constantly preparing everyone around him for his death, including his son. He's like, here's, all the steps to take when I die. When I die, this is what's gonna happen. When I die, this. So his son is very prepared for that death. I'm saying son and father because I don't wanna pronounce their names wrong. Well, Juan is easy, but I think Gaspar? Listen, I know I don't have the accent for it, but I don't wanna say Gaspar. Okay, quickest update ever. I am past the halfway point. I'm fascinated. We're in a bunch of different time, well, not a bunch of different timelines. We've really only been in like three. 
Um, and it's not that we have a totally different main character, but the person we are mainly focusing on for the first third is not who we're focusing on right now. So I find that really interesting. What is making me uncomfortable, I think intentionally, is um, there's stuff to do with children that is horrific. There are some ideas to do with the dead that are objectively scary, but not I don't think scary for the reader intentionally. What's making me uncomfortable that I don't think is intentional is like, well, maybe it is, I don't know. There are some weird relationship things going on and family dynamics that are making me very uncomfortable. Like somebody watching their parents have sex and like borderline enjoying it. And then there's like a relationship with some other people in the family. And I don't think it's supposed to be like a romance by any means, but I don't love it. Now, obviously it makes sense that I've been reading this for three days because it is it's actually only 600 pages, but I just feel like I've been reading it for a really long time. Um, I'm in the final part now. I think it's the final part. It's called Black Flowers That Grow in the Sky. And what I want to say about this is this isn't horror. That's what I want to say. Like my natural instinct is to say it's not horror. It doesn't feel like horror. And it makes sense that of all people to recommend it, it's Paul Tremblay because like this is a vampire horror book that's not and this is like feels kind of like a vampire horror book that's not it's actually to me feeling more magical realism than fantasy just with the way that the world is set up and all of the commentary that it has i feel like there's a lot of unexplained magic in here so if you want a really strong magic system i don't think that that's what you're going to get from the fantastical elements but since i'm not actually going to say it's not horror what i'm going to say is it's just, it shouldn't be on the list of scariest books. I am loving this, by the way. Like I'm having a good time. I think this is so incredibly well written. I like it so much. Um, but it is not comparable to the other things on the list that are like, you know, bone chilling and described as like frightening and jump scares like that. This is just not what you expect from a list of the scariest books, even if you could fit it in horror. I would say it's the same amount of horror as like House of Hunger, another like kind of vampire story, but not. It's more about like a group of people and control and trauma. Um, this has a big focus on, or a big reference to like religious trauma and political war um, trauma. This is set like in Argentina throughout history and clearly is pulling from historical events and dictatorship and talking about colonization and all of these things that are absolutely horrific. But it also is like a coming of age magical story and I love how the magic is involved and this order and how he's being protected and how it's described because you are reading from a lot of different characters and I think, okay, sorry, I'm gonna go off on a side tangent. Hopefully I come back to this. But I feel like when it comes to horror books that I love that get described as not really horror, the reason that it's like that and it feels like that is because you start the book at the end. And so a lot of the tension of the horrific things is lost because you establish something at the beginning. I'm thinking like Our Wives Under the Sea, even the Paul Bearers Club, which I know, like I know, I know, I know, doesn't fit into horror. Um, but it feels like you know what happened and then you're going back in time and learning how we got here. And so that's why it doesn't feel scary to the reader. The scariest books that I see people talk about, it's very in the moment. Somebody is being followed. Someone is being kidnapped, like someone people are being murdered around them. And a lot of my favorite books, they just don't have that same tension because you kind of know how it's gonna go. So as we go back in time and visit different people and how they encounter this man and his son, um, I really like how the magic is integrated and how the protection is described and how this, you know, there's somebody looking for this kid and it's not just that they can't find him, it's that there's a magic surrounding him. So anybody who like, thinks of him um like feels sick or they're looking for the house that he lives in and everyone's like oh yeah that's the house right there but like you can't see it seeing as it is based on real history and also has a focus on like mental health and sexuality for a good portion of this um there is a lot of like slurs and uncomfortable conversations regarding queer people and 
mental illness. It's all in the name of like highlighting discrimination and challenging certain things, fighting for rights and whatnot. So that's it's not that that's a negative thing necessarily. All right, I did it. We just got back from Liam's end of the season um, hockey skills competition and it was very fun to watch. And then I wrapped this up. Um, I don't think there's anything to say about this that I haven't already said. It was heartbreaking by the end. It had me emotional. It is dark. It's not only the imagery but how the author like talks about characters and um, the hatred that they are experiencing, um, the language associated with them and their disfigurements. We're two for two with Paul Tremblay though, like this was a 4.5. I know everyone's going to recommend that I read the other things from this author because one of them, her short story collection, was even in um, the other recommendation from Isabel Cañas, I think it was. So I'll definitely read more from her. Um, I know her other things are more popular. Oh, also I just wanted to note the tie-dye situation with the shirt. Um, I just found out that Bonfire does tie-dye. So there's no like lime green option and I think it's a newer situation and I had to become a verified user which was really quick and easy to get access to like these exclusive products on Bonfire. But yeah, there's definitely tie-dye on the website that I could have just purchased. Now obviously it's not as custom, it's not real tie-dye, I think it's just like printed and everybody's looks the same, but there's some really pretty options. So I think I am going to include those in the in the Literally Dead Book Club merch drop, though I'll note it is more expensive. I think it's like five dollars more for the t-shirts and it was like 15 or 20 dollars more for the sweaters, which seems a lot. So I finished the audiobook. I was gonna end this vlog by like going to the newest Scream movie, but I just got home and I don't know if it's because I woke up because the time change, like technically I woke up today three hours earlier than normal, but I'm starting to feel sick. Unfortunately, I'm not gonna be going anywhere. Uh, we just have two more books to read and it feels fitting that we're finishing it out with Stephen Graham Jones's like inspiration is what I'm taking these as um, since I just read his short story collection. The ones at the end were all wins pretty much. My five star ones were Raphael, which was, I can't tell you what these all are about, but like it started with the idea of invisible children. Um, and then the meat tree, I also gave five stars. It was kind of like a survival story in the woods, but not from her perspective. Um, the ones that got away was also a favorite of mine. And then crawl space. And my favorite thing about this is at the end, there was a little author's note of where Stephen Graham Jones gets his inspiration from. That's so cool because it feels like I just got to read an essay from Stephen Graham Jones about his inspiration and just his feelings about writing. And I love that. Like I love hearing authors talk about books. He has such a rich history with horror film and books and basically every single story he was like this was inspired by Stephen King. Like everything I ever write pretty much came it's just a stolen idea from Stephen King. My favorite things that he talked about in that though is that my favorite story at the beginning so perfect he said was inspired by Heather's and then in Raphael the reason he did a time jump in the story was because he just couldn't be in that moment anymore like while something horrific was happening in the story he was like I had to just leave the scene and write a different part of their lives and I loved that and then for the ones that got away I learned via the author's note uh that Paul Tremblay actually edited that story originally a lot of these stories were featured in other things magazines and collections so it's interesting that Paul Tremblay highlighted this one when he is partially responsible for the editing of it. Though if you take that into account, I feel like a lot of the authors, the books that they featured, they were involved in, like Alma Katsu, the short story collection, she literally has a short story in that collection. And then like a lot of these authors have worked with each other in capacity, so like they have a relationship. Not that that makes their recommendations less valid. Um, and then my, it makes sense that my very two favorites were Raphael and then Crawl Space, because he was saying that um, Crawl Space was actually kind of like a spin-off from Raphael. He wasn't done with that character and wanted to imagine him in a different scenario. I love that. Overall, I'm giving the collection a four, and that just means our tastes are definitely pretty aligned. So let's see if that's true for the last one up. Stephen Graham Jones. So this is about torture and child abuse. And it started out so innocently. Um, we did get this opening part that was like, I'm 
you know, a middle-aged man now and I'm married and I did, did terrible things and like I shouldn't tell my wife. But it was a really brief opening chapter and it didn't really feel, I don't know, I think I just kind of breezed past it and continued and then forgot that that's how it started because then it talks about like we have this main character and this girl moves in next door and she's really attractive and he's like 12 years old and it's his first crush. She's a little bit older and I had this like coming of age kind of vibe and them getting to know each other but there's also some other friends in this little friendship group and it was it was interesting um and then I want to say I like the 80 90 page mark I was like oh right this is horror we're good <laughs> what's happening it's not horrific in a fun way like it's it's not like oh my gosh we're in on this joke together now like I understand why this is everyone like talks about it but doesn't talk about this book no it's just horrific so here's what Stephen Graham Jones had to say naturally his is written in a more like narrative style than just talking about his taste in horror so he talks about something from his childhood how he got introduced to horror but then he says I like to suspect my fiction's been written by someone I should probably be careful about trusting I guess to me that means horror that feels really real and raw and like it could be true and like the author's mind is so fucked up that like how did they even come up with these words i'm not having a good time but i'm not supposed to be hello i finished my read of the girl next door i feel awful i look awful so um this is not going to be a coherent review but like even if i was in tip-top shape would this be a coherent review probably not all I have to say is fuck this book. Like literally, what the fuck? I, I am so incredibly disturbed by somebody deciding to write this story. Obviously, seeing as it's based on real life events, like people are so fucking disgusting and terrible. And it's not that it like, you know, romanticizes anything or I feel like tries to humanize anybody involved. So it's not that it's like messed up of him to write. It's just like, my God, the is just torture for so long. And you're in the eyes of this young boy who, uh, it's kind of like, at, at times almost feels like an unreliable narrator. She's being held captive by the group of them. Um, there is like an adult who is the instigator of the whole thing. Now, and I don't engage with true crime. I, I never have, I never will. Um, I just know it would make me absolutely so angry. So I did just like Google what her name was. The person this was actually done to and the person who went to prison and found out that she got out of prison on parole, which is like, I'm so disgusted that this, happened but so the way that you're seeing things through his eyes um somebody who like kind of feels like a bystander definitely a participant um is the way that he is interpreting this person being held captive and being abused um it almost sounds like from his perspective that she's like in on it like it's part of this game like she would be trying way harder to get out of it um, if she actually like wanted to leave. Also because I don't know enough about the actual event or if there's any like family members because the whole thing is these girls are orphaned um, and they're staying with this woman. But so I don't know if there is anyone to have an opinion on if it was like okay for him to even tell this story to take this and fictionalize it i think the intent is to like well i don't know this came out before i was even born good lord um like to shed light on the real life event or show that humanity is like can be really evil i have one more book to read tomorrow but i wanted to mention really quickly if you, when you saw me haul these this is for me to acknowledge and to let you know these are the same so I bought this like a year ago, a short story collection from Eric LaRocca, The Strange Thing We Become. And it got republished from a different publisher. Like this wasn't pub self-published. It was from an actual publishing house and then a different publishing house, I think. And now it's called The Trees Grew because I bled there. 
Which is funny because when I picked this up, I thought the title sounded familiar. And it's because it's right here. I have read this story before. Um, so it's the identical, like they are the same. It's not like some stories in here. It's just repackaged. It is a better cover. I am going to keep it. I'm a little bit annoyed, but that's okay. One thing leaving my TBR shelf without even having to read it. Look at me go. <laughs> hello, hello. Don't mind the weird yellowness of my windows. I have styrofoam. I have a foamy stuffed in there to try to block some light because I just started reading sprints with my channel members and I thought it'd be fun to see my first reaction live to Exquisite Corpse. I hope right from the beginning it does something grotesque and um, adds just some quality footage to this situation. There is someone recently out of prison. They join forces with someone else. They set their sights on an exquisite young Vietnamese American runaway whom they deem to be the perfect victim. So once again, we are in the mind of a killer, somebody participating in the horrific acts. And I feel like that's not something that I read in horror a lot, but it totally makes sense that that leads to the most unsettling uh, situation for people. So I have no doubt I am going to be uncomfortable. I read those first hundred pages hours ago now and it's late into the evening and I don't want to pick this back up but I'm obviously going to. I think I'm just wondering like what the point is of reading this as well as the last book I read that is just grotesque. Um, like there's no mystery. There's nothing you're wondering about. Like I like very action-based horror movies but a lot of times it's like you're waiting for a reveal. You're waiting to unmask the killer. In here, you're reading from that perspective and you can assume what's gonna go on from here. So maybe it's just that I'm not interested in the plot itself or I don't know what's interesting about it yet and maybe I need to get a little further into it. Uh, what's interesting is the perspectives, I guess, because each chapter is focused on a different one of these three men. So the first chapter, he, our main kind of guy, I think is based on Jeffrey Dahmer is what people were saying in the live show. And I, again, I don't know anything about the real life case. But in that first chapter, he escaped from prison and it was the most ridiculous first chapter of a book I have ever read. And then the next chapter we were following this other guy and then in the next chapter um, we were following the third guy and his relationship with his parents and um, certain like cultural norms in Vietnam and why he isn't gonna live with his family anymore, the way he's being treated this time, and the way gay men especially are treated in this time. And in that first chapter, I read all of the most disgusting things, um, murder, what he did to the dead bodies after murdering um, these young men and boys. And I'm just wondering if there's gonna be a plot that is interesting at least, because I understand the intent of just the shock value, but how I don't I can't imagine it getting more shocking maybe I'm about to completely bite my tongue on that but like why continue to read just for the sole purpose of being disgusted for so long so this was just as disturbing as promised and though it's kind of similar to tone as the girl next door this one I do feel more like I'm just in the know, like I understand now why people have talked about it and I find that interesting. And though it was gruesome and horrific, there were also moments that just felt so silly and that feels wrong to say because it's based on true 
events. But once these two serial killers kind of got in contact with each other, the things that they were doing were horrific. But their first kind of encounter, it just felt so wacky. Like they were trying to out gross each other. It was like they were becoming engaged and this he pulls a frozen head out of the freezer right and the other guy's like all right let me stick my hands down his throat like you thought you were shocking and nasty watch what I'm gonna do there were absolutely disgusting images um there's like cannibalism involved and the word usage of the consumption that was going on and the dead bodies hanging and the pudding like texture of the dead rotting corpse's stomach yeah it was it was awful i would put this in the unsettling category more so than the scary one i think like maybe i've just been desensitized to like growing up reading horror that things don't scare me but they absolutely will gross me out or i will be shocked that somebody would put that in a book and maybe that's what people do mean when they say a book is scary. I know some people are going to hate me for this but again I'm not actually going to rate it. I think this author he's no doubt talented with certain aspects. I wouldn't say this is an incredibly well written book like this is something that you read for the shock value. It's something that I would have picked up you know at age 14 if I knew it existed because I wanted to read something I thought was edgy but there is things to follow. It's not so much plot that's interesting, but we are just in the minds of like four men and their thoughts and their feelings and the things that they're deciding to do. And there's a lot going on outside of just the descriptions of death and sex, though that is the bulk of the story. So I think I can say um, my taste aligns enjoyment wise the most with Paul Tremblay and Alexis Henderson. I agree the most with Stephen Graham Jones's list of what is actually scary and disturbing. I think um, I remember Stephen Graham Jones doing an interview once where he said something about these books like he had read this 10 times over the span of five years or something because every time he was writing his horror he when he thought he was going too far he would pick like the most disturbing things up that he had read and remind himself that no like this is nasty disgusting gore and that's not what he's doing. So now I think it's time to build my own list of the scariest books that I've ever read. It's funny because I almost feel vulnerable listing these books because again just like the author's list that we're judging you might judge me for what I think is scary but I don't think I could create a little blurb that is super concise like the authors did of what I find the scariest but I think there's something about books only having two or three jump scare moments and the rest of it is or a lot of it is slower and more mundane that those feelings feel bigger when they do happen and they do freak me out. Um, so there, there is a couple things in House of Leaves that I was scared. I was scared to turn the page. The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires may be a controversial one, but I remember saying in the video that I read this when I ranked it with all of the, the emojis, I gave this one of the highest of the video for the scare factor. Because again, there's a couple moments that really frightened me for some reason. I also said the same about The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. And at this point, I don't really remember what those moments were, but I remember the feelings that it gave me. And I feel the same about When the Reckoning Comes. When I look back, uh, this is by Latonya McQueen. When I look back at those Goodreads videos that I did reading the best horror of the year, I also ranked this the highest with the emojis of things that actually frightened me. And they're all kind of different. There's ghosts and vampires, evil entities, an evil house. Like there's a lot of different things going on in those. But my list would be different if we're talking unsettling. Not counting the ones that I just read, which I would put on my list. Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. Tender is the Flesh by Augustina Basturica. A House at the Bottom of a Lake by Josh Mallerman, and You've Lost a Lot of Blood by Eric LaRocca. These ones I find to be the most unsettling, put me the most on edge. Didn't scare me, but felt just like uncomfortable or claustrophobic or shocked or worried. <laughs> As with most of my vlogs, the goal was to get more in tune with my reading tastes, and I think I did that. I found some wins. No new five star favorites, which is totally fine because I don't give out five stars a lot in this genre, but I had an interesting time with every single one of these. So thank you so much for watching. Let me know any other horror that you would recommend um, or your thoughts on anything that I read and I will see you later. Bye.